Ben, thank you so much for joining us again. Once again, Ben Gertzel is a computer scientist, artificial intelligence researcher, and a businessman. He helped popularize the term artificial general intelligence, AGI. Gertzel is the founder and CEO of Singularity Net, a project which was founded to distribute artificial intelligence data via blockchains. He's a leading developer of the OpenCog framework for AGI, and he was chief scientist of Hanson Robotics, the company that created Sophia and Grace, who we got to see yesterday as well. Thank you, Ben. He will be talking about how artificial intelligence brings longevity, escape, velocity nearer. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, it's amazing to be talking after uh, the great Jose Cordero, which uh, means I don't have to introduce basic things that this audience probably already knows about, like why living is generally better than dying if you're in a, in a healthy condition and, 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 and so forth. So, I, I mean, I, uh, I remember... I was about one year old and some elderly relative died and maybe two years old. I asked my dad, what, what did that mean? Why has everyone so sad they died? And uh, he's like, well, they passed on. They're uh, not here anymore. And I'm like, uh, what are you talking about? And finally, he's like, remember that dead cat we saw on the street the other day? Like, uh, basically, everyone ends up like that at some point. And this is this is one of the things I appreciate about my father, uh, Ted. He's 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 willing to get down to the point, right? So I, I I totally got it. Like all animals get old, they get died, they may get run over by a car, whatever, and that's going to happen to all of us. And at, at that point, it was just presented, of course, as a definite reality. Although I later found out that in 1963 or something, my father had led a protest group on the campus of, of uh, Antioch University, which was called SLAM, the Student League Against Mortality. So he was he was engaged in a in a protest against uh, death on the on the Antioch College campus a few years before before I was born. It was it was somewhat tongue in cheek. The, the students didn't have a big hope of abolishing death at that point, but they, at least they had the sense to see like. Uh, this is not a good thing. We should we should be railing against it, right? And so when I when I grew up, I even before that, I think age eight or nine, I encountered a book called The Prometheus Project by Gerald Feinberg, a physicist from Princeton. And Feinberg said within a few decades we're gonna have AI smarter than people machines so literally you can't see them building whatever matter we want and as well technology to allow us to live forever and then the question will be do we use this for rampant consumerism or do we use this to expand human consciousness in new directions and he proposed the un should put this to a vote of the world's population not whether to develop these technologies which he saw as as inevitable but rather what to do after we get all these all these technologies and what what direction to take our our culture right so i i read that book in the town library when i was a kid and tried to discuss it with other kids or adults and found that nobody would take it very seriously right they're just like okay some guy from princeton wrote this he's nuts goodbye where we're all going to die and machines being smarter than us is a million years away right so then Another decade or so passes, I graduate college, become a PhD in math, start understanding a bit about not only AI, but biology, nanotechnology, femtotechnology, whatever. And <clears throat> I could see pretty clearly all these things are possible, like modern molecular biology and biochemistry say the, bo the body is a complex molecular machine, right? And... I mean, from everything we know in neuroscience, the brain is in neural networks that's shunting around uh, electricity and, and, and chemicals, and there's nothing here that you can't build <coughs> can't build in a computer. And in fact, DNA and RNA are molecular machines, so why couldn't we build other molecular machines? Like it seemed very clear to me as soon as I got to understand 
science in my in my late teens, all these things are possible. Then you have the question, why does everyone not see this? And why does society not not do anything about this? Like, why do we just all accept, you know, we're going to get old and die? We have to work for a living all day for our, for our whole life instead of making friendly machines to do it for us. Like, what? Why do we? Why do we take the status quo for granted when we've developed the amazing formal systems of science and mathematics, which allow us to systematically extrapolate beyond the status quo and very clearly see what what will be possible? And then, then this gets you into human individual and and collective psychology, right? It gets you into the function and, and dysfunction of, of the human human brain machine as, as, as to why we, we take the, the attitudes that, that we take. So I think, you know, I was born in 1966 when I read Feinberg's book was the early 70s. When I started to understand science was the early 80s. So now we're in a different world. And regarding AI, Suddenly, we're in a situation where if you think human level AGI is 10 years off, you're sort of a pessimist because there are some captains of industry saying it's only five or six years off, maybe, right? And regarding radical super longevity, there are venture capitalists out there investing money in projects that are literally aiming to prolong the maximum human lifespan. Now, most of these investors are investing in a very unimaginative way and only want to invest in projects that have a drug already through human trials or something. So it's certainly not where it should be. But I mean, the US FDA has approved people to, you know, get official license for medicines that have a purpose of prolonging life, right? So I, I mean, I think we're, we're in, we're in an era now, were things that earlier in my life and uh, Jose, Jose's life, earlier in the life of, of all of us, uh, people who are old by conventional standards, though, of course, we're all infants relative to our immortal future. But in the, in many of our childhoods, these things were considered outrageous. And honestly, before the Internet, it was hard to find one single person who took these things seriously, right? Because you could talk to everyone you saw every day and no one would take AGI or super longevity seriously. So now... Now we're in a time when these things are taken seriously and the scientific and engineering possibility of these once seemingly radical things is, is clear. Never, nevertheless, that doesn't mean it's determinate how and when these things will develop, right? So in, in the scope of the history of the universe, the entirety of human evolution is an incredibly tiny little little blip. And then in the scope of human history, this century is, is is a little blip. Like when we when we look back in history, it's hard to remember what happened 200 BC versus 300 BC, right? It's it's all kind of the same. So I mean, whether we solve aging in 2030 or 2090 or 2050 matters very little in the grand sweep of history. On the other hand, it matters to me at age 57. It matters to my mom and dad at age at age 80, right? I mean, and of course, it matters to the evolution of human society and, and culture in a, in a whole lot of ways, because I, I think this is a deeper point. I won't go into too much because I want to get to some of the science I'm working on. But when you ask why is humanity so fucked up to be crude about it like why why are we self-defeating why do we not come together to systematically seek what is actually in our own interest and toward our own benefit i mean there are many reasons for this i mean it go it goes back to our our evolution in in various ways the ways individual and group selection work together to to shape our brains it 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 goes back to the fact that we evolved for paleolithic lifestyle roaming around in the savannah and now we're living in, in cities and civilizations but I, I think the sublimated fear of death has a lot to do with it like the, the the fact that we all know we're gonna die and most of our life go around denying that to ourselves this this does not have a healthy impact on our psyches either right like so solving solving aging solving aging 
is good in itself because life is good and each of our lives is is good well with with a few exceptions but m- m- most people's lives are good and and but it, it's also good because solving aging will lift a huge psychological burden from humanity even if most people don't see it that way now and i think we'll put us in a better position to solve the many many other interesting problems posed by the advance of technology now my pc was in math my big scientific passion more than anything else has been trying to build real thinking machines but as soon as i mean i had an interest in not dying ever since i was like two years old and realized that dying was that was the default but for me the human genome project around the year 2000 2001 was a big threshold event because you know as a programmer i can understand code and understood machinery you know dna rna proteomics these are all molecular machines seeing the code for <clears throat> the code for humans and animals i mean that gave a lot of hope that curing disease and, and curing aging could be a practical thing to do i mean clearly knowing the human genome was sort of like seeing the assembly language code for a very complex program running on a machine whose architecture you only half understand and trying to reverse engineer everything the program will do while it interacts with the world while it's while it's running after the program compile compiler and interpreter deals with it right so clearly just the list of genes in the code is not enough but it seemed like hey now we've got a foot in the door right and so I started spending a bit of time at that point using machine learning tools to analyze DNA and RNA data. So SNP data, single nuclear polymorphism data, and <clears throat> gene expression data, which at that time was mostly from a cDNA a microarrays, and trying to understand <clears throat> a bit of a bit of a cold hopefully i live through this talk on immortality but yeah um trying to understand how to use machine learning to figure out what differentiated longer lived from shorter lived organisms within a species and across species from machine learning analysis of this genetic information and what what you found was an abundance of riches which is the point i'm going to come back to in a few minutes when I dig into my current work with long-lived flies. I mean, we just, I mean, the gene expression data back then in 2001 when I started on this was super noisy. SNP, SNP data was was better, but there wasn't that much GWAS data out there. But from the data you could get your hands on, it was clear if you compare long-lived populations with shorter-lived ones, there are many, many, many genetic differences there. And in order to figure out which of these differences were most causal for longevity, you would need different kinds of data than were being gathered. You would need time series data longitudinally across the lifespan of of organisms. And you could see no one was gathering that. Like no one was even doing experiments like uh, let's look at mice that happen to be longer lived and happen to be shorter lived. And let's, you know, do clinical blood work and gene expression on these mice every week through their life and, like, see what's the, how does the dynamical system di- differ between long-lived and shorter-lived mice, right? No one, no one was doing stuff like that, and it would have been easy enough to do stuff like that. And I went, I met with people at National Institute of, of Aging in, in D.C. I got to know some folks in the longevity research community. I think I got to know Aubrey de Grey around 2005. Probably I met him at Bruce Klein's amazing Immortality Institute conference in Atlanta, Georgia in, in 2005. I'd gotten to know a few folks in the longevity research world before that. I found so many good ideas about how to do science to address aging and not much funding for it and now now that's 
starting to break through, but just starting. I mean, there's tremendously more money for, say, improving skin cream to give people shinier skin than, than, than there is for actually curing the fundamental processes underlying aging, for, for example. Now, around 2008, I think it was, I got to know Michael Rose. Could have been you know, a year plus or minus. And he he's a professor at UC Irvine. And he'd been doing a very interesting experiment since the mid-1980s, actually, where he, he wanted to see okay, what would it be like if you had an organism living way, way, way longer than the typical members of, it, of its species? And what could you discover about aging from looking at that? So we'd taken uh, fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, and, and was, was uh, experimentally evolving them in the lab to try to make super long-lived fruit flies, right? And already by that point, you had fruit flies living maybe 1.7, 1.8 times as long as the control flies in terms of the average of the population. Now it's up to like five times or something, right? So so that was very interesting. That was an example of the kind of thing that seemed super obvious to do, which almost nobody was, was doing. And I, I jumped into collaborating with him and the company Genetion that he founded somewhere along there to apply machine learning to to that data and i'm i'm still working with those flies which i'm gonna talk about in a in a in a in a, in a moment because i i think i think now we're at a very interesting position where ai is working better than ever before and deep neural nets and large language models have grabbed a lot of spotlight but there are many other ai approaches that work well too and we can connect them all together right so AI is doing a lot better than before, and biology has certainly advanced, though not as as rapidly as AI. We're getting a lot nicer ways to measure what's happening inside organisms, like cDNA arrays are garbage that we use in the nineties. Now you have you have RNA seq. You 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 have a lot of better ways to measure what's happening. You can you can do single cell assays with a precision that, that we could we could never do before we can we can do metab metabolomics we can look at dna methylation and other epigenomic stuff right so we, we have a lot of more ways to measure what's happening in the body now than we did way back when and we have much better ai to integrate all this data together so i think i think we're well poised over the next few years leveraging all the data gathered by modern experimental biology equipment and modern AI, I think we're well poised to make some interesting breakthroughs on the biology of longevity, which then can lead to therapeutics in a variety of different ways. And I would, I would say our technologies for delivering therapeutics have not advanced as rapidly as our technologies for measuring what's ha what happens in the body, but there, but there's certainly been advances. I mean, at least at least we have CRISPR and some forms of gene therapy that that somewhat work now. And for for rational drug design, you can use machine learning and other analytical methods to design molecules that will, that will dock with with proteins that you specify and so on. So there, there's been there's been some advances on the on the therapeutic side as well, which which all all fits into this picture. So I think I I titled this talk How AGI Can Help with LEV or something. And uh, I LEV, of course, is longevity escape velocity, a.k.a. the Methuselah, meaning the point at which if you can live that long, then probably before you die, there's going to be other advances that will let you live even longer long enough to merit from yet other advances that will let you live even longer and, and so forth. And we may have passed it already. I, I, honestly, we don't know at 57. I, I, I may be past it because my expected lifespan, if nothing bad goes wrong with me, would be around 80 or something. And, and actually, I, I do think within the next 23 years, we're very likely to develop things that will extend my life a few decades beyond 80 and and then 
let, let, let the rinse repeat, but it's uh, it will be nice to have greater certitude, right? And while I titled the talk How AGI Can Accelerate LEV, I'm not sure that we need artificial general intelligence. I don't want to go too deeply into AGI versus narrow AI now, but I mean, what I mean by AGI, a term which I introduced in a book of that title in 2005, what I mean by AGI is AI that can take imaginative leaps beyond the data and programming that's been provided with. So sort of heroic feats of mental generalization, which us humans are capable of sometime. In fact, which every one or two-year-old child has to do routinely in, in, in figuring out the world, right? And certainly the capability to radically generalize beyond experience in a speculative yet grounded way would be valuable for, for curing aging, no, no, no doubt. So I'm almost sure like once we get to human level AGI, we're curing aging very shortly after that because a human level AGI scientist, <laughs> I mean, this would be a human level mind that had direct ability to access all of the biology data sets in the world and, and to run bioinformatics and machine learning tools with its mind, right? I mean, I think once we get human level AGI, we're going to crack aging very shortly after that. On, on the other hand, could we crack aging without human level AGI with just like the current assemblage of AI tools and smart humans working together? It's less certain to me, but it, it seems quite possible also. I think the answer isn't either or. I mean, the, there's a lot of resources on the planet being spent on much less useful things than either the quest for super longevity or the quest for AGI, right? So, I mean, I mean, I think what we need to do is, what we need to do is push on building AGI and, and we need to push on using available AI technology to advance aging as, 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 as well as I can. So, yeah, I was told by the conference organizer that I had frozen, but I, I, fortunately, I, I did not actually freeze. I've been moving all along, but it's. Uh, I guess my 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 net connection must have flaked out for a moment. But let me let me share my screen for a little bit and uh, go through some of what my colleagues and I are 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 doing now to try in practice to, to use advanced AI to extend extend human life. So what we're talking about here is how to use today's AI, which is much cooler than last year's AI, and next year's AI is going to be even better. So how do we use today's AI to revolutionize human life? Spend this this is work I'm doing with a number of colleagues in a project called Rejuve Biotech, which we've spun off from the Singularity Net Decentralized AI Project. And there's actually two Rejuve projects that work closely together. One is Rejuve Network, which is a decentralized uh, blockchain-driven network of longevity enthusiasts sort of contributing data about themselves to a decentralized data commons to be used to help uh, study how to achieve super longevity. And then the results obtained from that will flow back in therapies and, and in economic rewards to the members of that network. Then Rejuve Biotech is sort of the laboratory research arm of Rejuve. This, this is run by Kennedy Shaw, who was the primary person working with Michael Rose doing the actual evolution experiments on, on the long-lived fruit flies. So it's run by Kennedy, who we, we affectionately know as Our Lady of the Flies. And then uh, also we have Axel Schumacher, who was the uh, original inventor of the epigenetic theory of, of aging, and then a number of others. And my role in the project is sort of to guide the use of AI, but we have some some actual biologists in, 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 in involved as well. And 
I mean, what we're aiming to do with Rejuve Biotech is, you know, manifest the promise I alluded to in the first part of this talk. Like, we have the data, we have the AI now. Getting resources is still not easy, but it's more plausible in the past. It's time to time to just do it. And, you know, it's about radically expanding human longevity. But along the way, it's also about addressing all these age-associated diseases that, that screw with us, right? I, I, I mean, whether solving aging is just about addressing <clears throat> age-associated diseases is a point of contention. On the other hand, we don't really have to solve that question to make a huge amount of progress because it's clear that aging, and I'll come to this point in more depth in a moment, is it's clear that aging is about a huge variety of different processes intersecting with each other. And many of these processes are also a large part of the story underlying age, age associated diseases. So there's very little doubt that making big progress toward radical human lifespan extension will also make progress toward, you know, making people feel better, who feel bad because of all the age associated diseases we have out there. So a bit about the AI that we're working on. We have a knowledge graph or knowledge metagraph, one could call it, which is a weighted labeled metagraph with nodes and links pointing to each other all over the place. And we can we can feed quantitative data into this knowledge graph. We can also feed relational data, so semantic relations extracted from texts, for example, or from doctors' reports from research articles. We can extract information from diagrams and so on and, and charts and put them in here. So we're we're building a big knowledge graph linking together everything related to <coughs> aging and <coughs> LLMs are actually being a big help here, large language models like GBT4 for a sort of funny reason. Like if if you, there's a lot of data that's open source now on the websites of NIH and other organizations, not not as much as there should be, right? I mean, there's still important data about our bodies, which are proprietary data sets and usually not even shared with the humans whose bodies produce the data in those data sets, right? But there, but there is a lot of open data. And ironically, the, the bottleneck in importing all that open data about the bodies of humans and other animals into an AI system, the bottleneck in importing that data historically has been something really stupid, which is like the row and column headers on the data spreadsheets. So you have a data set, which is like the supplementary data set to a research paper. It's usually a bunch of numbers and the rows are like LD slash C sub mu 2.1 or something. And, and to interpret what's in the row and column headers on a data set that some biologists put online requires some scientists to dig through the paper and figure out exactly like what normalization was used, what notation that means, what units were used. So it turns out we can fine tune a large language model to do that, to interpret the metadata, the row and column headers on, on, on data sets, which lets us suck a whole bunch of data in, into this uh, knowledge graph. Atom, in this case, we use it, it's in the sense of a logical atom rather than a physical atom. So we the nodes and links in our in our knowledge graph are, are, are called atoms. But so we we can pull stuff from research papers and also from data sets into here. And you can pull in data about people from all different experiments, also from from animals. And this data can be used in a lot of ways, right? So it can be used in neural networks, in say graph convolutional networks and so forth. Neural nets are natural on graphs. It can also be used in symbolic reasoning systems and probabilistic logic systems, which have some advantages over current neural nets in terms of the ability to carry out sort of systematic uh, multi-step reasoning. But what's interesting is, even though there's so much data out there now, no one's pulling it all together. And we're, we're just in the early to mid stages of pulling it all together 
in our own bioanalysis project. When you look at what pharmaceutical companies do, they will pull together a lot of data pertinent to the specific disease they're studying. So like if a pharma company is studying lung cancer, they will make a huge cross-linked data set of data about lung cancer. On the other hand, they will they will tend to then keep this proprietary to themselves. So then it doesn't it doesn't help other other researchers out outside outside of their of their of their company, right? So we have an AI architecture acting on this uh atom space where the atom space is a large large uh, white box which has a neural and symbolic as, as aspect to it and uh, feeding a bunch of different data in there human data public biological data data from the rejuve network that i mentioned which is longevity ent enthusiasts who are contributing data about their bodies in this network then data from the long-lived Methuselah flies through a partnership between Reduve Biotech and, and, and Genesh, and, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that a bit about that in a in a moment. So there's a block in this diagram called AI code. There's actually a lot going on there, and more than I'm gonna try to go into in this talk because I want to go back to our little uh, fruit fly friends. But if you Look up the AI system OpenCog Hyper on the new version of the OpenCog system, and you can find links on it from the website of a trueagi.io, which is an, an AI company, which is another spinoff of, of Singular Net Foundation. OpenCog is itself an integrated AGI paradigm, which applies to biology, but also to a lot of other things. I mean, so we're using it by humanoid robots, we're using it, well, we will soon be using it by some game characters in the Sophia Verse virt virtual world. We're, we're using it for some automated math theorem improving. The general nature of OpenCog is you have a knowledge metagraph which feeds in data from a variety of different sources, different sensors and language and so on. They can take actions in a variety of ways, be it through a robot or a game character or lab equipment or just saying stuff but then you have a variety of different ai algorithms acting together on the same distributed knowledge metagraph which can include various sorts of neural nets logical reasoning engines evolutionary le learning engines concept formation heuristics so we have we have a lot of ai stuff that we've been developing here first in an open source community, then in teams within Singularity Net Foundation and True AGI. I, I would say it's got to be the largest AGI-oriented project outside of big tech companies, the largest AGI-oriented project not focused primarily on deep neural networks, but including deep neural nets as one among many tools, and also the, really the only serious AGI project that's building things in a decentralized way so that out of the box it can, it can run on a decentralized blockchain-based network rather than having to be on a network that's that's owned and controlled by, by a single party. But this is its own whole story that I've given a lot of, of talks about. What we're doing in Rejuve Biotech, we're leveraging this AI along with more mainstream machine learning and bioinformatics tools to analyze an integrated knowledge graph of cross-organism data pertinent to longevity. Now, all the data in the bio space is important, and you don't know what data is going to be more important for a given problem until you've tried, right? On, on the other hand, the data that we have from our partnership with Janeshin from the Methuselah flies, I think does have some unique and and particular value. And this is because organisms are complex self-organizing systems. And aging is not just about, you know, one subsystem, one awry, or one gene has a, has a mutation or something. Aging is a lot of different things going wrong in many different systems of the body, in many different le levels of the body, right? And I, I, I mean... Because of that, having data sets that give you a whole organism understanding of aging 
is very, very important. And to get that sort of data, you want to be able to study organisms over their whole lifespan. And ideally, you, you would like to have as much contrast as possible between the long-lived and short-lived things in, in, in your data set to sort of amplify the signal for the noise. So 43 years, 400 plus generations of directed experimental evolution. I think 20 years of this, the evolution has been directed by Kennedy Schall, who's the CEO of, uh, of, of Raju Biotech, who we recruited uh, from, from Genescient to, to help out with, that, with our, our AI project. So it's five times as long as lifespan of, of control flies. So, I mean, this is like, it's like if tens of thousands of years ago in ancient Sumeria, some king had decided to start breeding a, a, a tribe of super long-lived people. Right, but of course, humanity didn't do that. And as a human, we I feel more ethical issues doing that with people than than, than, than with flies, right? And you get you get very rapid turnaround time. I mean, the life cycle is is fast. I mean, the, the long lived flies now live several months, but the growth to reproductive age is, is quick, which means that you can pretty rapidly evolve and you can rapidly run experiments too. So I mean I mean you can you can you can do an intervention, give them a drug or something, then the the kid kids of those flies will will pop out in in weeks. So I mean it's flies are not humans, flies are not mammals. There are many differences from their bodies and our bodies. There are also many similarities and to study those similarities it's incredibly valuable to have a model organism that that just iterates iterates so rapidly right so what what we're doing in rejuve biotech has a number of different elements that i that i've described but we're we're aiming to use data from the methuselah flies together with a whole bunch of other data we've integrated together to a Try to just understand better how aging works, and then to design therapeutics. And and these these can be supplements, which we've had some success with. I'll talk about momentarily. They can be drugs or drug cocktails. They can they can be gene therapies of of, of various sorts. I mean, what what we can understand from looking at the flies in conjunction with other data. <laughs> is like what genes in what tissues do you want to zoink in order to prolong lifespan? Uh, and zoink is intentionally a not very technical term because supplements, drugs, or gene therapy do different modes of, of, of zoinking, right? And designing designing the right way to, to affect the genes that we need to affect in your AI analyses is a, a whole other process, which, however, AI can be helpful with. So we have some evidence that's, that looking at the fruit flies with AI can be valuable because when I was, when I was working with Genescient 10, 12 years ago, we did some analysis of the long the fruit flies then, which were living at that point only around two, 2.5 times as long as control flies, not the five times longer that we have now, right? But even from analyzing the flies we had back then, we were able to identify collections of genes that were varying together in long-lived versus control flies. Then we were able to use AI to determine combinations of Chinese herbs whose active ingredients were chemicals that, that docked to the proteins that, that, that were coded by the, the genes that were different in, in variation and behavior in the long-lived versus normal flies. And then we tried these herb combinations on flies. We found you give these combinations of herbs to middle-aged flies. It makes them healthier, prolongs their life, makes their heart works better, lets them have more sex, lets them solve problems faster and smarter. Then we tried these combinations of supplements on people. And we, we found that they could, in many cases, roll back moderate Alzheimer's di disease to, to mild Alzheimer's disease. So, I mean, it did, did something anyway. I mean, we... 
we designed a diff different supplement using machine learning on similar data, which combated inflammation across various tissues of the body. And you, you could see that in humans, it, it decreases the C-reactive protein count, right? So with flies that were less differentiated without this big fancy integrated knowledge base with earlier machine learning technology, we did manage to design combinational supplements that impacted both improving the health of the humans who took them and impacting biomarkers of, 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 of aging in, in these humans. So I, I worked on that 10 years ago or something as a consultant to Genescient, went away and did other things. Now I'm psyched to be back working on, on this stuff again. Yeah, this, this chart was from flies with uh, Alzheimer's that received our supplement, but didn't. So these were model flies. You, you, you give the flies Alzheimer's by feeding them uh, abortion pills, strangely enough. But then, but that seems that's a standard way of, of making Alzheimer's model flies. But you, you, you can, you can see the flies with Alzheimer's crawl slower and slower and slower the older they get. The the x-axis is how longer the flies are alive. The, the y-axis is how long do they take to crawl, to crawl to get their food. The older they get, the slower the Alzheimer's flies crawl. And you have, that's also true for non-Alzheimer's flies and flies in our supplement, but the, de the degradation of aging is much worse and the lifespan is much longer. Like you see the line stops after nine days with the Alzheimer's model flies. So the supplement reduced the Alzheimer's model flies almost to the level of the healthy control flies, right? So that's, uh, I mean, that doesn't prove the same level of impact will be had in people, I'm sure not, but it did It did improve assays of, of uh, neurocognitive function in, 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 in people as well. So this this shows, among other examples we did, these examples show that even though flies are not people, like the, the approach of studying the long-lived fly genomics, using it to design therapies, trying those therapies on flies and then trying them on people, like this is not just a pipe dream. Like doing this a decade ago with a weaker genetic signal and a worse technology ecosystem altogether still allowed allowed something to happen, right? And then this, uh, this graph shows what we had with a, with humans it's a different test it's a cognitive test but i mean you see decline over the course of the experiment is the orange line which is folks with moderate mild alzheimer's who didn't take our our, our supplement and the the green line is the ones who did take it and you know they didn't decline the same degree now i'm i'm totally not here to hawk supplements right i mean i mean i mean i think it, it's it, it's valuable i take a small number of supplements too i mean it's it, we should do whatever we can right now. I, I don't think a combination of Chinese herbs is going to let us all live to 1 million, let alone even 150, right? But on, on, on the other hand, it's a proof point for, for the analogy mapping from flies to humans, on, on the other hand. And the same targets that you hit with these supplements, what happens if you hit that same combination of of, of targets with, with a gene therapy, right? I, I mean... We're, we're, we're in a very crude way following up some of what the AI has found, but you could follow the same AI findings in a more sophisticated way. So from looking at the Methuselah flies now, we find some pathways that are not, they're not like a sirtuin pathway or something, right? We, we find some pathways that are not at the top of people's list for how to cure aging, which, however, are at the top of the list for what makes the super long lived flies different from the from the control flies. The reg X one and reg X two pathways are am among am among them. One is a metabolic and neurological pathway, and another is more nitty gritty with cellular electron transfer. And we're now trying to do more experiments to try to understand why these path what is the action by which these pathways potentially help increase Methuselah's span lifestyle lifespan? If you if you look at complex system models of transcription factor networks, 
You can also identify a small number of transcription factors that appear to have a key causal role in regulating the genomic networks underlying the Methuselah fly. So at, th at this point, we've crunched the data enough to see what seem to be some very major differentiators. And the next step is to explore therapeutics that would hit on these things as well, so to do more, more causal analysis to understand what, what, why they have the effects that they do. And one interesting thing we found, more broadly speaking, is the flies we have now, which live five times as long as control, versus the flies we had 10 years ago, which lived around twice as long as control. The difference between today and 10 years ago fly is massively, massively more than the difference between 10 years ago and control fly. So it's it's not like as we keep the ev evolution going, it's not like the divergence peters out. Actually, the divergence is getting more, more and more. It's like we're like we're 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 not we're not, we're not done yet with the, but but the, the 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 other thing that's that's interesting is even though there are more and more differences, it's also much clearer which pathways they're, they're they're focused on so we're getting a louder and a clearer signal from the flies at five times than at two times the the control fly lifespan which is is really a big vindication of michael rose's vision back in the 80s when he started you know flogging his uci undergraduate students into into breeding breeding long-lived flies it was a, it was a vi quite visionary thing to do and so now in this project we're sort of following a fairly standard biopharma company roadmap in that we we're identifying targets using machine learning will create candidate therapeutics which can be a mix of uh supplements uh small molecule potentially gene therapies we'll try these out on animals, flies in this case, and try them out on, on humans. I mean, I think you can go to market with supplements faster than you can go to market with uh, with drugs and faster with drugs and with gene therapy. So we can pursue all these in, in, in parallel. But I think a number of things can go faster than in the past. Like everything up till human trials can go faster because AI accelerates discovery. And of course, you can go straight to human trials without any animal trials now. But on, on, on the other hand, Flies are fast to do trials on, so I mean, we try stuff out on flies, but we can we can go relatively rapidly now from <clears throat> from discoveries on the AI informatics level to at least trying stuff out on on people, and then once you start trying stuff out on people, of course, we can do clinical assays, we can do gene expression studies on the people. And we can discover, you know, maybe some cocktail of therapies works better for some people than for others. Like we can really do personalized medicine now do, using machine learning applied to to genomics, which I, I think can accelerate progress also. Now, still doing human trials takes time, right? And we don't even have a substance in human trials yet. We, we, we may by end of this year, Year early, 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 ne early next year, even. But uh, I mean, still, human trials takes time. So I mean, if we if we can get to a human level AGI within five years, then in the end, that may that may, may be faster than these therapies getting F FDA approval. But I, 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 as I said in the start of the talk, I think it makes sense to be pursuing parallel avenues of inquiry. Like I. I think we can get to human level AGI in five years. If it takes 15 years, I'm not going to shoot myself, right? So, I mean, if it does take 10 to 15 years, I'll be happy to have a really working life extension pill five or six years from now to increase the odds that, that I can wait out the 10 or 15 years, right? Now, all these are blips in the historical context, but they mean they mean a lot to the particular humans who, who are, are alive today. And that is what I had to say.
Thank you so much, Ben. On that note, with how long the timelines are for drug development or getting drugs to market, of course, one of the main goals of Vitalia is to have an alternative to FDA approval. There's even talks of starting in an FDAO, or like a decentralized version of FDA, or just different processes so you can do those faster. Have you considered running any trials or exploring Prospera, Vitalia, or alternatives to the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, think, I think that's uh, that's an amazing uh, possibility. <laughs> amazing possibility to have out there, right? So for for supplements, it's it's kind of kind of easy, although the government can be weird about what's a supplement or or, or, or or a drug and you can do that anywhere. But when you when you're getting into small molecule cocktails or or, or or gene therapies, I mean having reputable, safe, stable offshore locations to to do the early stage human trials, I, th I think is a uh, is going to be very, very important because you have, in terms of the interaction between science and funding, you still have a situation now where most of the buckets of money available for longevity research only want to fund things that have already been through stage one human trials. But then it's expensive and it's laborious in the regulatory sense to to get through the stage one one human trials, right? So, I mean, I think among among other ways of leveraging a resource like Vitalia, I mean, if you if you have, say, a small molecule cocktail or a mix of small molecule of drugs and 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 uh, herbs, and and you want you know it works in flies, you've tried it on some uh, mice and it doesn't hurt them, right? So then you want to you want to try it on a population of, of willing humans. I mean. Being able to cut a couple of years off the process of doing that by leveraging a resource like Vitalia is very valuable because then once once you've got those phase one human trials done, I mean then you know you may continue with Vitalia, but but also you have evidence that that allows you both to secure more funding for that project and to make regulators in various jurisdictions happier, right? So I mean I mean I think there's a there's many many ways that a resource like vitalia can be helpful for a, a project like rejuve biotech and and for everything else in the in the in the longevity therapeutics domain hi ben uh, it's Anders sandberg here uh, i was wondering about data quality issues how do you represent the different kinds of data quality you get especially from publications and especially perhaps also crowdsourcing that must be a real headache and seems to be a rather important problem for being able to deduce something well it's a, it's a headache it's a headache for the ai's head more than anything else so the the beauty of having a huge variety of data fed into an integrated knowledge base is that the AI can compare and contrast the different data sets. It can look for outliers. It can see whether a certain data point or a different data, certain data set makes sense in terms of all the other data in the in, in 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 the knowledge base, right? So I mean, yeah, in in a case where you have a data set that's the first of its kind, there may be nothing meaningful to compare it to. But that's that's not the most common case. Like I I dealt a lot with early microarray data, like CNA data, cDNA data, which has many many errors. But you you can definitely take this approach. Like I mean, if you have if you have two genes that are co-varying in a certain cDNA data set and those genes don't co-vary in any of the other hundred cDNA data sets regarding cancer in different human tissues, you're going to guess that co-variation is a, is, a, is a fluke, right? So I think the integration of multiple data sets in a common knowledge store helps quite a lot with that. And our our AI reasoning algorithms assign a confidence interval to each judgment that they, that they make. So they're, they're able to understand the 
confidence associated with the given data point and to propagate those confidence intervals, managing their widths appropriately as they go through reasoning. And this is one of the reasons I'm so interested in using automated probabilistic logical reasoning tools and not just large language models and other neural nets. These LLMs hallucinate random shit all the time. So they, they add to the noise rather than reducing the noise. They can be quite insightful, but what we can do is take a chain of reasoning or a conclusion suggested by an LLM. We can then feed it into a logical reasoning algorithm for verification. And where data is concerned, that logical reasoning algorithm is taking proper account of confidence interval widths in a way that LLMs, which are sometimes good at making suggestions, they, they cannot do the logic reliably, nor nor take into account confidence intervals, right? So I, I think it's that's solvable with the benefit of scale using modern AI tools, except in weird cases where you just have very little data of, of a certain sort. That's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for taking time both yesterday and today, Ben. It's been really wonderful to have you here and hopefully you'll be here in person next time. Thank you so much. All right, yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Live long and prosper.